with us on the call. We're recording for the purpose of um, placing it on our YouTube channel and having this call as a resource for the folks who couldn't come today. Um, and so I'm hoping everyone feels comfortable with that. With me on the call today and the people responsible for making this happen is Bonnie, Swain, Katie Fido is working as technical moderation, and so is Nathaniel Parsons, who's a new intern with us from the Mount Lebanon High School. We're excited to share with you our dashboard, which will be posted on our blog site. It will be posted on our um, website once we change over the web address um, to our actual address, alccourtwatch.org. It's not available there tonight, but we'll be able to lend you a link to it where it appears now. And this tool will continue as a resource updating each month to evidence the need to eliminate the practice of cash bail and to make continuous moves towards allevi alleviating pretrial detention and to show the impact of judicial discretion. The dashboard has two parts one showing bail trends, the other showing racial disparities. Um, the other is detailed breakdown of magisterial district court bail decisions at pretrial arraignments by the judge. For the Allegheny County's election cycle, the tool will enable your users to, um, to see which judges whose seats are up for election and what their practices are looking like. For organizations working to reduce death by incarceration, the data on the dashboard can be used to push for legal and policy actions addressing the disparities in our bail system. LC Court Watch is sharing this data on bail setting practices of our local district and senior magistrates. Um, so we're excited to have you on tonight. You know, we have about 40 some odd um, magistrates in Allegheny County and a bunch of senior magistrates who are making bail decisions every day. And so this will enable you to see that big picture as you go on to make decisions um, in terms of voting, but also in terms of pushing towards the end of pretrial detention and through it, the end of cash bail. I'm gonna turn the show over to Bonnie. Great, so what I'll do is actually, um, first I guess I'm Bonnie, she, they, um, and have been working with ALC on um, this dashboard and other um, data that's been made available through the tireless efforts of um, you know other folks working with ALC and other volunteers, some of who are probably here. Um, so I'm gonna drop in the chat actually um, a link to the dashboard for folks who want to follow along. And then we'll also screen share while we're talking. And um, if you want to be fully plugged in, it probably would just makes sense to look at the screen share. But if you're the type that likes to poke around and um, look at things, uh, that'll be great for you know when we take your questions and comments and feedback. So I'll share that now and um, actually turn it over to Swain first, um, because as we all um, you know, can see, there's a quite a bit of information. And I know coming to this work that there was a lot of groundwork to, um, to cover and understanding our very convoluted legal system. So um, go for it, Swain. All right. Um Hi, my name is Swain Uber. I uh, work with Abolitionist Law Center um, and uh, yeah, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm going to try to do as best we can, and given the short time, a very brief primer on bail um, and magisterial district ju judges and how that kind of works in Allegheny County. Um, the first thing that I want to point people to is uh, the PA Constitution. So, you know, we know the US Constitution exists. Um, there's also a state constitution within it, actually, in the first 15 uh, 
uh, sections of, of the Constitution, there's actually uh, the articles of the Constitution, there's actually two that pertain to bail. Um, the first outlines that bail cannot be excessive. And I, I can throw that uh, language in the chat really quickly. Um, it's pretty clear. It's very simple, clean. Excessive bail shall not be required, right? So that's the only thing that relates to bail. Good thing to keep in mind. Um, the second uh, article that pertains to it is Article 14. And it's very similar. Uh, here, let me throw that in the chat as well. Um, sorry, the formatting was off where I had it. But it says all prisoners, which includes you know any incarcerated person, it's just uses the broad term, shall be bailable by sufficient sureties. Um, and there are two exceptions uh, that are pretty important. One is capital offenses, which is within Pennsylvania, there's just a specific subset of charges for which someone cannot be bailed. Um, the second group is much more convoluted, and it says, for offenses for which the maximum, uh, oh, sorry, for unless no condition or combination of conditions other than imprisonment will reasonably assure the safety of any person and the community when proof is evident or presumption great. Essentially, there is certain instances under which uh, a bond, a bail can be denied, uh, which is different than setting a monetary bail. So the way and I'm sure there's some general familiarity with how uh, bail works in, in Allegheny County, maybe there's been some people who I know there's some people who have run uh, preliminary arraignments here and, and overseen them, but I'm sure there's others, many more who have viewed them. But essentially, what a preliminary arraignment is, it's the first step in the criminal process once someone's been arrested and charged with a crime. It is the bail setting process. And in Allegheny County and all of the, the state except for Philadelphia, um, it, those, those hearings are held uh, by magisterial district judges. Uh, magisterial district judge is the kind of lowest rung, no, no offense to any MDJs here, but the lowest rung of the uh, judicial system in Pennsylvania. Above them is the Court of Common Pleas, who people may be more familiar with. Those are the folks that you see, you know, the names out there, running for judge, et cetera. And then there's uh, two, two superior, there's a superior court, Commonwealth Court, and then the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. These are all state courts, separate from the federal system. But so the magisterial district judges, there are 46 in Allegheny County that are elected to serve in their districts. There are, however, a, there is a second group of uh, magisterial district judges, which are called senior judges, which we'll get into a bit more later, that's a separate distinct group who are formerly uh, magisterial district judges and then kind of stay on after retirement. We'll get into it later. Um, so what happens in that bail setting process is an individual, again, has a right to bail that shall not be excessive um, and they should be bailable by sufficient sureties except for when instances of bail, a bail denial. Um, the dashboard has really wonderful uh, specific definitions of the different types of bond that are allowed to be set in Pennsylvania. Um, it's right there on the right hand side. If you can see it, people can click on the link that Bonnie provided uh, uh, in the chat. It might be, I know a couple more people have popped in, so maybe it's worth sending it again. Um, but, but it's important to, again, understand that a bail denial is one thing, and it has to be for these reasons right here, right? So either a, a specific charge, you know, related to capital pun, you know, capital charge, or that it fits all those spe other specific categories. Um, then if the person is found that they can be bailable, not a non-denial, it falls into one of the other categories. So either the person can be released on their own recognizance, which is essentially no condition or monetary bond is placed on them and they can return on their own. And essentially the only thing that they're required to do is to show up again um, and not commit any other, you know, be charged with any other crimes. A non-monetary bond is the step up from that where it's, you're not being required to pay money, um, but you are, there's possibly other conditions. Maybe it's a no contact. Um, maybe you have to check in with some other thing that can actually be pretty burdensome, but it's a non-monetary bond. So it's not about 
financial capacity in that scenario, usually. Um, then there's kind of two types, well, three types of uh, monetary bond. One is, uh, one is called unsecured monetary bail, which is essentially you get released, sometimes with, with potentially with conditions or without, um, but then if you don't show up, you can be required to pay that amount. So if it's $5,000 unsecured bond, I don't have to pay this $5,000 up front, but if for some reason I miss court later, they can try and come after me for that $5,000. Um, the other type is secured monetary bond, and there's another two types within that. Uh, secured monetary bond means you have to pay up front. Uh, one is uh, what's called straight bond. That's not an official term, but it's you pay the full amount. So if it's a $5,000 bond, you have to pay $5,000. Uh, there's a percentage bond, which is if it's a 10% in Allegheny County, you typically see 10% of X bond. If it's 10% of 5,000, then you have to pay 5,000 up front. But again, if you don't show up for the later amount, it's, it's as though it's the remainder is unsecured. So then you can be on the hook for that remainder. Um, so the, the magisterial district judge is supposed to take into consideration when setting bonds, uh, these specific, oh, I'll throw this last link. I'm not gonna include all the criteria because it's pretty, uh, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, but they're supposed to follow these rules in, or, in order to determine what amounts or what conditions need to be set. Um, that does not frequently happen, as we know, and uh, it's, that can be one of the main issues entirely. Uh, the Pennsylvania, there's, there's another specific link that I want to set. So bail itself, monetary bond, should only be set uh, in instances, you know, the purpose of bond is to make sure that people show up for court, right? And whether or not that's a good idea, uh, you know, it's it's pretty clear. There's been some studies that have shown that it's not actually necessary to have people appear in court. Um, but even even uh, the the criminal, uh, the P Pennsylvania, I forget what the PCCD stands for. It's P Pennsylvania Criminal Connection. I don't remember corrections something. Um, but they 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 talk about that that is the purpose, right? The purpose is not to keep people in jail, right? So you do you cannot set bond, a cash bond to keep someone in jail, right? You have to deny. What happens in practice is what hap if you click on that link, you can see later that they say, oh, well, the bond is, you know, the amount of bond depends on the charges, depends on lots of other things. That is improper. Uh, other courts have found around the country, mostly in federal courts, that if you are setting a bond uh, and it is a bond that you know someone cannot pay, you are essentially denying the bond, which means you have to go through that denial process in general. So what we're going to see here and what Bonnie's going to show, and I'll, I'll end on that, is that there are tons of bonds that are, are set that are unpayable, which lead to people sitting in jail in instances, in instances where they should have been released solely because they could not afford the bond they were paying. There, there was a study uh, that I think the ACLU of PA did. I'll, I'll throw that link in the chat too. Um, pretty recently, uh, where they studied the, yeah, hold on. It's called Broken Rules. And they studied all 67 uh, counties in Pennsylvania. And they found that over half of the people who had cash bail set didn't get out, um, which means that the system isn't working how it's supposed to because bond is supposed to solely make sure that you appear at court, not hold you in, in the meantime. Um, so yeah, so a lot of information. I'm sure there's some questions, but we're, we're, we got to get into the dashboard um, that I know looks overwhelming as well, but there's a lot of wonderful information here and we're gonna, we're gonna jump into that now. Cool, thanks, Swain. Yeah, that... Um... The information is probably, you know, not new to some of some of the folks here, but um, it's important kind of uh, context setting for what we're looking at as well. Um, and just to break things down, um, you know, from left to right, you know, we have the names of um, the magisterial district judges on the left. Um, and you know, some of the judges have longer names, um, but they'll they'll come up when you hover over. Um, and, 
you'll see that right next to that we have um, something that we're calling election status um, for 2023. And this was this is as of the most recent primary, um, but mainly to call attention to a couple of things. Um, one being, of course, the you know this is uh, the election period is one of the few periods we have for um, I guess accountability in the, in the way that um, is built into the system, um, what there is of it. And um, we'll be talking a little bit later about how to plug in and um, find your local MDJ. Um, but the other thing that uh, we also indicated was senior judge status, which uh, Swain also mentioned earlier. Um, and all, you can filter to all of those um, through this little dropdown. And um, Swain will explain a little bit more, but um, senior judges uh, essentially have been given um, lease past you know, their, uh, the typical retirement age to continue on um, serving wherever, um, I think to their discretion. And um, it means that they're also not subject to uh, ele re-election or election um, and have also the highest number of arraignments. So um, maybe I should have mentioned or backed up a second in the, uh, in the sense that all this data is coming from preliminary arraignments, um, which are the um, you know, court hearings where you are, when you where you get the first uh, bail decision um, and we take that um, decision and that's that's what's presented here. There's of course a lot um, that happens after that, you know, some of those decisions get reversed, um, bond gets denied and so on, but for simplicity, we're showing that. Um, so yeah, when we sort by the number of arraignments by judge, um, and right now we're looking at like all the data that we have available from June of last year to May of this year, the end of May of this year, um, you see that most of um, the senior judges are also the judges, you know, who see the most cases, and that's that's not surprising. Um, but what's also apparent, you know, and again, this is a sort of scale of impact um, issue, is also that um, those judges have um, more power over defendants. If you are, if you show up to court. Um, pre-trial, you know, you're most likely going to be, you're more likely to be, you know, seeing one of these senior judges. Um, and the, that kind of brings us to what I just filtered to, this um, held uh, measure. So the, this is just um, our shortened um, term for denied release. So uh, basically not given um, a non-monetary or a release or ROR, um, release on recognizance. Um, and that usually you can see is uh, tracks quite similarly with the um, number of time, the percentage of times that um, uh, judges gave monetary bail. Um, but sometimes that is, um, you know, somewhat somewhat different, and that can vary also due to um, denials and. Um, you know, high, higher denial rates, um, obviously also resulting in um, some amount of pretrial incarceration. And um, this, the number that we um, represent here is also from the court dockets indicating whether there was some period of time um, recorded in uh, Allegheny County Jail. So that, that is, you know, um, also truly being held in jail. Um, as a count. So the percentage again, um, you know, 79%, it, what we're seeing here, you know, 79% of the 623 arraignments here resulted in defendants um, facing pretrial incarceration. Um, and um, yeah, that that's that's a number that ultimately we care about the most. Um, there's also ways to look at other measures, um, including, for example, the total amount of bail set um, by judge. And um, you get into kind of astronomical numbers, um, 
and um, in in the next uh, in the demographics um, dashboard view, we'll be talking a little bit more, breaking it down kind of on the individual level. Um, but it's a staggering um, sort of impact on the community um, in in terms of paying out that much. And um, what you see then from the right, on uh, um, the sort of set of uh, colored bars are um, a breakdown um, proportionally, proportionally of the different types of bail decisions made. Um, so if you added all these up, you would you should get the total number of arraignments here. And um, it's color coded on the right where uh, this purple is um, represents the number of denials. Um, you can see it's uh, there's a five you know, th these 39 denials are 5.6% of all the arraignments um, that um, Big Stevens um, made from, you know, June to May. Um, then we also have uh, what Swain talked about earlier, the um, monetary bail set at the full amount or, or you know, straight uh, monetary bail. Um, in the orange, there's um, the number of um, monetary percentage um, bail decisions. Um, again, that being a requirement to pay a percentage of the bail amount set, typically 10%. Um, and then from there, uh, the unsecured monetary bail, which again is not required um, immediately or not required for release, but it can be um, asked for if, um, or must be paid if you do not show up. Um, and then we have the non-monetary bail decisions, which again are um, results in release with certain conditions set by the court. Um, and then ROR, which um, like um, Swain explained earlier is um, a, a release without those conditions. Um, so the, um, the purpose of this once again is to kind of see um, the um, judges with the most impact in terms of, um, again, what we care about the most in terms of the folks who are being held pre-incarceration, uh, pre-trial, sorry, um, incarcerated pre-trial. Um, and also to kind of see, um, you know, whether there are judges with higher um, patterns of setting monetary bond or higher denial rates. Um, so you can see, you know, Carolyn Bengal um, has a maybe lower rate of setting monetary bond, but a still pretty high rate of um, uh, percentage held. And that's uh, most likely due to a very high denial rate, um, which is, that's, you know, you, uh, comparatively quite high. And, you know, that's also something that we can see who are the, um, who are the judges that have really high denial rates. Um, we also, of course, um, you know, you can you can change this to look at a time period that maybe you're more interested in. If we maybe just want to see um, what uh, bail has looked like so far in 2023, we can do that as well. Um, so, one thing again that we'll return to is just um, the uh, scale of impact by different judges and the. Um, uh, the high rate of um, both the high rate of um, you know setting monetary bond or denials resulting in higher rates of um, people being incarcerated pre-trial or um, uh, or just having a higher overall number of folks um, being held and that um, corresponding quite um, quite often with again our senior judges who float to the top again when we filter for um, the number of folks held. And even if I think it probably makes sense to, to look at, um, you know, 2023 and even within 2023, we still mm -hmm. have our senior judges appearing. So yeah, um, Swain, I think we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and yeah. why we want to pay attention to that. Yeah. And I just think, thanks, Bonnie. That's great. So I, I just wanted to kind of be clear about what the what this uh, dashboard's focusing on, which is different than what maybe a lot of other dashboards or other um, goals are for different 
uh, different things that are already out there. This is focusing on the actual magisterial district judges themselves, right? Like, so this isn't about, you know, and obviously we're all here because we care about the people who are hurt by this system, right? And that's, you know, all every single number here is a human and a family and a community that's been harmed. Um, but their names aren't included. Their specific stories aren't included. Um, we do have demographics, which we'll get to, but like the goal and the purpose of this, which, which we, you know, we want you to all, we, you all to use it. We want you to focus on, you know, your judge and we'll get to this later, but we, the, the purpose is to figure out who is setting these bails and what are these judges doing, right? Like that's like what that's we're, trying, what to we're get trying to get to. Um, the, uh, so the focus is, you know, like what's judge X do over this time period? You know, oh, maybe, and then who's seen so many cases? Why are they seeing so many cases? Like, if you can see, you know, scroll down, uh, Bonnie, if you can. Just some judges have seen way fewer arraignments, right? Like some, you know, have only just, yeah, Savakis, six, six over the, so, thus far this year, right? Um, others have, you know, what's the highest thus far this year? Like 300. Three, yeah, Craig Stevens. Why does Craig Stevens do that much? And it's like, okay, it's all right. You know, his held percentage lower than some, which seems good. Um, but, you know, why, why is he doing so many? It's still, you know, it still means the harm is this much. And, you know, you saw Santa Cola before. Her denial rates seem pretty high, but it actually, you know, she doesn't see that many cases. So her, the overall harm may be less and things like that. So that's, this, this is for you all to use as a tool to, to understand the system better, understand the judges who technically you all elected um, and we all elected, right, uh, to, to figure out what's going on. And we'll get to that, you know, specific accountability things later, but just wanted to, like, make sure that that framing was clear. So senior judges, right? So, yeah, we, we already talked a bit about senior judges. They're one of the more... Uh, less transparent aspects of the current system. Um, there's some peculiarities about how and why and where they operate. Um, a senior judge essentially is a former uh, magisterial district judge. People call them MDJs typically because it's very long mouthful uh, to say every time. But senior MDJs are people who were formerly MDJs and kind of stay on um, part of the purpose is just to increase capacity for the overall system, but also, hypothetically, this is what Pennsylvania uh, says, is to reduce costs because sometimes they pay them less or sometimes they take less money, et cetera. I, I don't think there's actually, uh, we, I, I've, I've looked for some information and data about that. It doesn't seem to be particularly clear either way, um, but essentially, uh, there are people who are not elected right now. Um, but may but were previously elected that are currently sitting in um, on arraignments, which is one of the more critical parts of the criminal process in terms of actual harm for individuals and families, because it's the initial detention uh, proceeding, and that can you know with there's there's great studies that show if someone is detained, their likelihood of being uh, acquitted goes down their likelihood of you know they the harms as we all know they can lose their house their kids their job lots of other terrible effects we know that acj itself has a you know ex extraordinarily high death rate um so so yeah that's that's you know the senior judges do all these things but with even less accountability and visibility than the the, the current uh, mdjs that that are out there um they also and this is just about a pure, like a happenstance of the way the system works right now in, in Allegheny County. And it doesn't have to work this way, which we can get to in the accountability portion. Um, but senior judges often take the night shift at uh, in, for preliminary arraignments. Um, the way it typically works is there's one judge who takes the morning shift, one judge who takes the afternoon evening shift, and then one who takes the night shift. Night shifts are almost exclusively uh, done by senior judges. Some of the reason you know, the reasons given for that are that uh, non-senior judges, regular MDJs, have caseloads during the day. They have the regular courts that they have to deal with, so having a night shift, you know, would mess that up. Not totally unreasonable, 
But what that means is because of the way the criminal legal system works right now, um, senior judges see the most arraignments because people get, when do people mostly get arrested? In the evening and, and at night. So that means people are being arraigned in the evening and at night the most in terms of frequency. And many of those people have senior judges. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, many of the senior judges we have in Allegheny County, uh, at least the statistics seem to show they are more um, regressive when it comes to bail setting practices uh, than almost every other judge that is currently sitting as an MDJ right now. So yeah, if you can go to the full one, uh, um, and and uh, uh, Abhishek, I'll, I'll answer that question too quickly, just while we're at it. But if you can see, so there's of the, and if we don't do the total amount, if we do, yeah, percent number held in jail, great. Um, you can see of the top, what, eight, nine, of the top eight, uh, six are senior judges, um, which to me says a lot and and I think is something that we're hoping to, that this dashboard will get out in the public more and and increase awareness of because it's it's a problem and it's leading to a lot of harm being caused. Whereas you know many of our current sitting uh, magisterial district judges, especially some of the more newly elected ones, if if you scroll down, Bonnie. Um, right down you know down there some you know people have much much lower numbers um which you know yeah, for example uh, if you look at xander orenstein sees 141 cases right but is only held 12 percent you know much much better than for than than whoever is number one it's it's burletic or something i think um and then if you look at yeah uh, and if you let me find, oh, yeah, yeah. So look at uh, if you look at uh, Jehosha Wright, who just popped in. Hey, Jehosha, um, one hundred and seven, which is a solid number, right? Like that's seen quite a few. Only seven percent have been held. That's what that's what should be happening, right? In terms of you know what the PA Constitution says and what uh, you know the the rules require and what bail is the purpose of bail is to be set for that's what should be happening we should be seeing that percentage for everyone um and for some reason we're not and we're seeing for the, some many of the senior judges numbers in the you know high 60s 70s 80s even uh which is outrageous and and you know one of the primary if not the primary driver of pretrial incarceration that's not related to probation which is totally separate so yeah, that's that's my mini senior judge rant. We'll get to uh, we'll get to again specific accountability measures potentially later, um, but but yeah, if we can move on because I know we're we're already getting short on time and we have some questions piling up. Yeah, I think um, originally we're going to pause for questions at this view, but I think we'll just take questions all at the end. Um, I know um, uh, on our side we're keeping track of the questions that are being asked and we'll kind of um, answer them kind of in batch at the end. Um, uh, although there was one uh, comment that was asking about demographics and so on. So that is what this next part is addressing. Um, and, you know, again, this doesn't um, dive into, again, the like individual specifics of what's happening, but it, um, you know, the, we know that a lot of um, the, the folks that, you know, ALC works with, um, in, um, it, uh, you know, address, like want to address, um, sort of the racial inequities, um, or want to call out those racial inequities, um, with bail. And so that's the goal of this second view, um, on the same dashboard, you just click on the other, um, button. And, um, one thing that, um, this uh, should default to is um, filtering to um, severity of charges at, at, you know, in terms of the lead charge to misdemeanor or um, summary uh, offenses. And um, that just being a very, you know, unfortunately, there's so much more to say about the inequities around how charges get um, uh, 
well, how charges get trumped up and and also um, are also racialized. Um, but it's you know one of our one of our tools in filtering out and seeing um, sort of more egregious patterns around um, bail decisions um, at the race and gender and other dem demographics level. Although we've left out age for now. Um, so again, to just break it down um, right now, again, we're, we're just remaining on um, misdemeanors or less, the decisions around that. Um, on the top right um, is a table that sort of breaks down um, bail decisions by race and gender, um, again, by you know, denials and then full monetary bond, um, monetary bond that requires a percentage. Um, unsecured monetary bond, and then non-monetary release with conditions and release on recognizance. Um, and we've broken it down by um, by race and gender. Um, there, there, we we do have um, numbers on um, you know other races and other genders as collected by the courts, but um, as you can imagine, it's it's they don't do a great job. Um, and their the numbers are um, not as many. Um, but the breakdown, at least um, when you're when we are comparing um, black folks to white folks in terms of the again, also the gender breakdown, um, you know, at, at a um, basic level, if you were to show up to court again and um, you know, just, somehow we're able to flip the switch on your race, the likelihood of um, being denied bail is you know, 1.6 times higher according to um, our, one of our data extracts. And um, you know, the likelihood of getting monetary bail is 1.25 times higher, whereas for white defendants, um, you're 1.27 times more likely to be released on non-monetary or RR bail conditions. Um, and um, you also see then when we break it out, um, you know, by by race and gender, um, we see that you know black defense or defendants are more likely to be denied bail, and especially black male defendants, um, the um, uh, and least likely to receive um, ROR or um, non monetary release conditions. Um, and uh, this view also changes as um, we select individual judges, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this table in a bit. Um, so, um, well, actually, I'll talk about it now. <laughs> so, the um, the percentage held that um, measure that we talked about before, um, again, um, is just a way of shortcutting, uh, um, you know, denied release. Um, so either denied bail or receiving monetary bail. Um, and when we broke, break down the um, percentage of um, defendants uh, by race that um, who, who, um, whose bail decisions result in uh, being held uh, by judge, sorry, that's, that's a mouthful. Um, uh, we, we get this view here. And I actually see that we're looking at a, a subset of things here. So once again, you know, we have um, judges that have um, that see more arraignments that um, oversee more cases, and um, many of those again being our senior judges. Um, Craig Stevens is still popping up here. We um, we we have a short sort of bit with that. We don't um, know why. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, we can, we can find out, I'm sure, why he, he's probably just trying to, he probably does a lot of evening shifts for some reason, but yeah. who knows. So definitely, yeah, um, has higher and higher impact. Um, and, um, but yeah, essentially what we're looking at is, you know, of the 222 Black defendants um, that, um, you know, in the preliminary arraignments had Eileen Conroy as their MDJ, you know, 45% of those uh, defendants um, were held. And, you know, we can kind of see who has the highest um, kind of rate with that. And if there are differences um, across, you know, uh, racially, 
Um, and we also see, you know, across all judges, you know, that um, the, I guess the, the norm seems to be a 32% health rate for black defendants um, with, you know, within all the black defendants and then 27% health rate for white defendants. Um, and that this number, you know, varies quite wildly um, between, um, between judges. Um, and um, uh, the other thing I mentioned is that when we select individual judges, we can kind of take a look at, you know, what that breakdown looks like um, on that same chart that we were looking at earlier. Um, so, you know, with, um, I can never pronounce his last name, but Robert Zvonik. Javonic. Javonic. Uh -huh. Like a J kind of. Javonic. Cool. Javonic. Um, that the, um, you know, the rates in terms of bail decisions, um, when we break it down here, um, you know, can see differences um, if there are any um, across, um, you know, both race and gender. So again, you know, um, this in this case, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference, but there are some noticeable. Well, this is the misdemeanors and less, right? Yes, yeah. So yeah. maybe so you can for, still for see might be. exactly. There's still overall, um, you know, um, and you can see here that his stats are quite similar, so that makes sense. Um, but if we if we look at someone else who um, maybe has like a marked difference in terms of the percentage of black defendants held and percentage of white defendants held, there is a difference um, with, you know, um, a, yeah, a significant difference in terms of rates and, and um, either with receiving some sort of release decision being um, less likely, uh, especially for black men, um, and also higher likelihoods of um, getting, uh, receiving, you know, monetary bail decisions and, um, you know, the worst or the most difficult to, um, of, of those decisions, the full monetary. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, this is again, another place, um, you know, to break that down when we look at the uh, MDJ view and see maybe, oh, that's great. You know, only, I don't know, uh, 15 people are being sent to jail or, or facing pretrial incarceration. Um, looking at the also from the demographic side, we have to ask also, you know, if that um, is playing out, um, you know, inequitably um, in, in terms of our system being set up um, to like further in racial inequities. The, la right. the last thing I'll mention, sorry, is just that um, we also have a breakdown of the amount of bail, average amount of bail being set, again, also by race and gender. And um, uh, that, you know, on average as a whole, Black men pay, you know, 1,800 uh, more than that um, than other demographic. And within misdemeanors, um, you know, that's um, much higher you know, in the realm of monetary straight, uh, again, the full monetary amount that it ends up being much higher than other demographics as well. Um, and that playing out at a system wide level. Um, and this is also something that we can filter to and look at individual judge decisions. Yeah. Sorry, I, Swain, you were going to say something. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just going to say, so as as probably many people here know obviously the entire criminal you know punishment system is uh you know disproportionately affects uh, people of color and specifically black people uh Alle and i'm sure a good number of you all know as well that allegheny county jail in particular um is right now and and over the past x number of years has uh the population is over you know, about over two thirds um black whereas you know the population for allegheny county is only 13 percent so the disparity uh that we know exists within the jail and 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 again people can be held in the jail for lots of different reasons bail is actually not um the primary driver of that cash bond uh the primary driver of that is probation detainers which we can get into another time um but it is one of one of the primary uh drivers and uh this you know this data mirrors it 
and makes it more personal, not to the individual who uh, is being held, but to the judge who sent them there, right? So we can see, you know, if we click on uh, Riccardi, for example, um, <clears throat> you know, there's there's judges out there. He's uh, right further down, 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 right there. Yeah. So, and it, can you do uh, felonies? Not, not the, or all, all. So we can see, uh, wait, where, who was it Ricard? Wasn't it Ricard? Is the, who had the, it was someone who had a pretty, either way. Um, oh, I remember who it was. Okay. I think it was um, so, so they're, they're, you know, each individual who is in ACJ is there because of other individuals, right? Like that's how the system works. I know that's not how we're, we're taught to think about it. Um, but they're there because of the officers that arrested them and the judges uh, that determined they should be held, right? And for various reasons, and sometimes, sometimes you know, unconstitutionally. Um, this helps us figure out who's holding people and whether or not their uh, their practices are, at least on their face, discriminatory, right? We can't, you know, you can't, without getting into very specifics, it's hard to make that sort of statement categorically. But we can see patterns um, for specific judges that are quite concerning. And I think uh, they, each individual judge, should look at their own data and be like, oh, why is mine so, you know, why is the, uh, is it so disparate? Like, why is there such a massive disparity between, and maybe it, you know, could hypothetically go either way. Obviously, uh, it doesn't usually uh, go both ways. Um, but it's so it's it's important to figure out, yeah, who, yeah, for example, here, great. Um, so if we have, you know, uh, the number, the percentage of uh, black men, this is M -M, right for men, uh, who are given a monetary bond, is significantly higher than the percentage uh, given to any other category of people. So black women. Black, uh, white men, and white women. So it's 53% if you see up there in the top right corner. Um, Non-monetary, significantly lower. Right, again, those, you know, typically one would mirror the other. So for some reason, this individual, uh, so Randy Martini, again, this, this is something we can get to, Bonnie, about there's a senior Randy Martini and a junior Randy Martini that the data is a little messy on that front, but you know, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, but but for this specific individual, the data shows that this is what's happening, right? So that, um, you know, that you can look up any judge and we'll, we'll again, the next section will deal, will help you figure out who your magisterial district judge is. And you can also, of course, figure out who any of any of the judges are and senior judges, et cetera, and, and see how they're doing both on the overall side, denial side, et cetera, but the demographics as well. And, and of course, like this, this in particular is where the specific anecdotes and, and stories of like many of the folks here I know are court watchers. And, you know, the work that you all do in person is critical. Obviously, it was great when we used to be able to go online. Um, we don't have that access anymore. But going in person to get these stories and see what's happening in the moment allows us to add additional context that I know Autumn wanted to share a specific example of seeing this kind of uh, disparity in action, um, seeing, you know, again, perhaps unscientific in certain instances, but we know what we see and we know what the, you know, s since it does mirror the statistics, um, seems like a pretty good example to share. So Autumn, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, just example. really quickly, I know that we're running down on time and we wanted to give opportunity to address the questions in the chat and on your mind but you know when we're looking at data sometimes we sort of move away from the fact that this is like real life there are names there are faces there are stories behind each one of the people that are affected um alluding to what one what one of the questions was in the chat and some of what swain said earlier um i was court watching not too long ago maybe a month ago um and i went into the courtroom one in the district court, the magisterial court next to, next to the jail. And uh, Magistrate Stevens was 
on the bench um, and a group of arraignments were coming up and I got the opportunity to see those. Um, and there's a public defender who's assigned to arraignments. Um, she was in the room and she brought to my attention and for actually just so that it could be recorded to put on record some um, disparities in his bail decisions that day. It was um, Magistrate Stevens. And among about a dozen people who were arraigned that day, um, the decision seems to be based on two things. There are two qualifiers that come to the magistrate for his attention, her attention, their attention. Um, and prior to the time that they're interacting with people who are then defendants, um, they're making these decisions. So they're making the decisions before the arraignment formally begins which makes this process more ceremonial to me um, than anything um, because they're not overarchingly not engaging the defendant in their bail decisions. Um, so I saw two teens ages 18 um, be held and denied bail after basically a street fight one of them missed his graduation, was not able to walk in his graduation because he was held without bail. Um, the first set of vetting criteria was the with the risk assessment tool, which was overridden um, by an unnamed person. And then there's, um, they come against the pretrial services, I think does some type of interviewing of the person. Um, and the judge decided to go with the override and deny bail for both teens. And during that same set of arraignments, the judge had decided to override himself, the decisions of um, pretrial services, JRS algorithm that had asked that two white men be denied bail. So in that set of arraignments that I watched that day, um, two white men who had originally been um, recommended to have their bails denied had previous charges, uh, previous cases on file, um, were not denied bail and given bond, um, while the two black teens who were true zeros in the sense that they um, were not required to be kept were were denied and that really stood out so that's those are the kind of situations and examples that this data represents right like that's happening every day as you all know except someone's not there to watch it right um that's that's the difference and and what this is hopefully starting to break open is we can see better at least from this sort of you know statistical perspective, who's doing what, right? We're not going to get that specific story without being there in person, without engaging with individuals. But at the very least, this starts to give us a bit more of a foundation to understand, you know, which judges should we be focusing on? Who are who do we need to be worried about? Who do we need to be advocating for? You know, uh, who do we need to be supporting for for doing the right thing, and who do we need to be pushing back against for doing the wrong thing? So we just got a question, I think, that transitions us really well into the last part of taking action. Um, but we are also at 7.30. So um, I think for folks who yeah, need to hop off, feel free to do what you need to do. Um, and we'll talk real briefly on actions that we can take and answer any questions that remain. Yeah, I'll throw into the chat the first of a couple of links. Um, so how to find your local magisterial district judge. And these are the non-senior judges. So there are 46 districts in Allegheny County. Um, there are 12 within the city of Pittsburgh and then there are another 34 outside of it. Um, every single person who's here, who lives in Allegheny County, uh, lives in one of those districts. Um, this is not a great, tool, but it's a tool that you can use. Um, the other tool you can use, 
uh, is this other one, but you can here you just search a street name and then a zip code because the street name alone, we know there's a million, like there's a million main streets, right? Um, so it won't necessarily get you what you need. But for example, if you live downtown on Ross Street, um, you put that in, you put the zip code of where you, you know, that address, and then you would realize, oh, I am in, and this is correct, uh, I am in Oscar Petit's district, um, which is true. And he's one of the 12 judges within the city of Pittsburgh. Um, the other option is that the second link that I just threw in the chat, uh, which is just a list of the 46 different MDJs and the boroughs or wards that they serve. So it's the least useful for uh, the city of Pittsburgh because not everyone knows what ward they live in, um, which is totally fair because it's an old classification. Maybe you know some of the more political people here know that, but if you live in, for example, Glassport, right? If you scroll up right there. Oh, all right, there's my judge, right? And there's the address, et cetera. If I live in Green Tree, oh, I get Craig Stevens, the one who sees tons of uh, arraignments for some reason. Um, and what you can do, right? So as, as Bonnie mentioned, as Autumn mentioned, lots of other people have mentioned, uh, the non-senior judges, so the currently sitting or soon to be elected magisterial district judges, there are elections, right? So we just had a primary a month plus ago for the Democratic primary, well, and all primaries. There's going to be a general in the fall, uh, in November, right? There is still time for someone to run against some of these judges. They can run as independents, um, or you can still advocate for both with candidates uh, to have them, you know, recognize. Well, what you can you can work with them to educate them on their practices and what the data shows that they're doing, right? So being like, hey, uh, Mister, you know, Judge Stevens, I, I, you know, I live in your district. I, I, don't, I don't think he's even up for election, actually. I live in your district. I know uh, this is what it's, the data shows you're doing. What's up with that? Like, why, you know, how can you improve this? It, it doesn't seem to be like doing the right thing in lots of different ways. Why are you studying this, blah, blah, blah. So, you, you know, these are, these are uh, individuals who live and work in your communities who are your representatives. Yes, they are judges, um, but... They're elected, right? So you can advocate with them. Obviously, you know, doing it in specific instances is a little less, um, uh, probably won't be seen as, as light nicely. And, and you know, you, you probably would not be able to do it in a specific, you know, arraignment, for example, um, depending on the scenarios, maybe you can. But if you are just talking to them about the data, uh, the harms of bail and other things like that, you can do that. You you are you are a constituent and you are able to do that and they should listen to you. Um, so feel free to use this to figure out who your MDJ is and contact them and and make it clear like what you uh, believe, what organizations you work with and represent, know are important and and what we know works, um, which is pretrial freedom, right? Like it it increases people's chance at trial later, reduces the harm of the overall criminal punishment system. And, and it's just an overall better thing that some of the newer uh, magisterial district judges are doing and it's having great results, right? So that's what we wanna see, but for everyone. Oh, and also the constitution, you know, limits what they do, but that's, you know, they, they might not believe you, um, but, you know, you can, you can say that as well. Cool. So, so yeah, we have uh, lots of questions. Should we get to that? Uh, do you want to take the first one, Bonnie, about updating? Yeah, so this this will update monthly. Um, so we are at the tail end of the June, so we don't have that, but it, um, we will have June data in July um, with you know some, some delays. It's not immediately after July 1st, but um, uh, there's also, yeah, I think hopefully we answered some of the questions about the demographics and, um, you know, offenses, uh, that, that information availability. Um, there's more that we have again around yeah. age, um, but, um, and especially focusing on, on youth was one of our main yeah. concerns, but that, you know, sort of like a really smaller number, um, which uh, we can kind of focus on, you know, at like a more regular interval and, um, by individual basis. 
Um, yeah. And then, yeah, yeah there, there's hopes. Out. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is the first iteration of the dashboard, right? This the possibility for additional tabs. Um, one thing that I know I'm interested in that I hope we can see at some point is, you know, the, the time of day setting, like, and and who who is setting it at different times. I mentioned, you know, that senior judges typically do all the, the night shift. It'd be great to like see that um, concretely and to know that like, oh, high bonds are all being set at night. Oh, senior judges are all <laughs> doing the ones at night. Oh, this seems like a problem. Um, so that's, you know, that could be one age, including age somewhere could be another ethnicity isn't actually recorded that well on the dockets. Sometimes it is. Um, but but yeah, that we can, you know, think about how to potentially include in fu future iterations as well. Um, I see the question about where does the money go that's collected through bond? We, we actually didn't mention bail bonds companies. Um, which is a critical part of the current predatory system. A lot of the people who, you know, it, it shows that a bail was set, um, many never pay it, right? Many are, you know, stuck in jail for the, the duration of the proceeding. But others who do pay it, almost all of them use the bail bondsman, um, which typically puts up the whole amount, but keeps a portion of it um, for themselves, regardless of what happens. So a bond, if it's paid in full or the percentage, et cetera, uh, typically is returned, should be returned. The idea is like, all right, I'm putting it in a security that I will appear um, for the proceedings, right? And even if I'm convicted, right? Even if I'm later convicted, I get that money back because I was there for every part of the proceeding. Um, that does not happen with bonds companies. They keep that money and it's essentially a tax on uh, the most vulnerable people in our, our county and state and country. Um, and it's not a company type of company that should exist or, or serves any public purpose. Um, and frankly, it uh, aids the current unjust and unconstitutional system that judges are setting bonds that like, sure, maybe a bondsman could pay, but no individual could pay. Um, and yeah, they get out. So they kind of it feeds off each other as they just set high bonds that no individual would be able to pay. So it's actually outside of their ability to pay, which would make it unconstitutional. But since bonds companies exist, it's, it's a mess and it's it's very harmful. Um, so bonds company money goes to them, stays with them, right? And you pay a percentage of it typically. Uh, other money is deposited with the court and is returned at the end of a proceeding if it wasn't revoked at any later point, if that answers your question. Yeah, so and I feel like also the question around senior judges, like what what's the possibility around um, doing anything around their seats? Yeah, did. yeah. So it's a new area that we're like working on. Um, I did throw in the chat how who determines it. It's the PA Supreme Court. There is also a ton of deference to the local president judge, who is currently Judge Kimberly Clark. There's going to be a, an election, internal election. So the president judge in a given county, most of them are just single counties, um, elect, the Court of Common Pleas judges elect their president judge every three years, I believe. And that there's going to be an election for a new president judge this year, I believe, who would start next year. That judge... And, and the administrative judges and, and staff that work in the courts determine, actually make a lot of the more determination, like specific determinations of who does what, where. Some of it is capacity related, like they, like they talked about, they don't want to, but, but there's no reason that we couldn't collectively advocate with court administration and court leadership. So the president judge and administrative judges uh, to reduce their reliance on senior judges, senior MDJs, who we see are disproportionately setting high bonds, denying bond, et cetera, and leading to a large percentage of the people who end up being stuck in ACJ on bond-related holds. So the, the, technically the Supreme Court holds it, but a lot of the power is here locally too. And the PA Supreme Court on these sort of issues typically defers to local leadership.
I'll also just quickly ask the question that I realized we skipped was um, around getting the underlying data. Um, so um, there is a download button for the dashboard. Um, I think that um, the data uh, button being grayed out, I'm not sure why that's happening. There should be a way also to get, um, uh, a, it, granted is a more convoluted way, but to get, get the data through the tablet workbook. Um, uh, the cross tabs, unfortunately, I think you can download individual data sets, um, but that's because that's how the kind of the dashboard gets put together in, in, in various pieces. Um, so we'll, we'll just look at like why the data button is grayed out right now. Um, so, uh, all I can say right now is just, uh, check in later on that. And I think the last, well, uh, in the last batch, the last question was um, why the focus is on MDJs, not the judges. Ah, great, great question. It's because they aren't involved in setting bond, right? So all bond setting, the original setting, is only magisterial district judges. The the quarter and, and actually, magisterial district judges oversee the first portion of the entire criminal process, criminal legal process, which is um, the preliminary hearing as well. Um, there is an option, and this does happen sometimes in Allegheny County, not all the time, where someone can request bond to be reviewed by a court of common pleas judge um, after their preliminary arraignment uh, and try to get it modified either like to non-monetary or release on their own recognizance or lower the amount or things like that. Um, but yes, so the reason we're focusing on MDJs is because they're the ones who set bail not the court of common police judges, MDJs. Court of common police judges do a lot of other really important things that we can get into at different times, but bail, when, when you think of bail, think of MDJs. Well, and then we have our last two so far, one being on the suggested readings on the harm of bail and the other on property bond. Um, yeah, property bonds, I, I think you're asking about, like, do sometimes people have to put up property, um, not with the court, um, they don't accept property, they, it's, it's only cash. What most people, like where you hear that most is actually people working with a bonds company and having to put up collateral for them to agree to take on a higher bond, et cetera, in addition to the, the payment, the cash payment they make to the bonds company. Um, and yes, the harm of bond, uh, I mean, nothing, I, I, I literally am just gonna Google it uh, and see if something well, familiar pops up, but I was here, I, I would say... recommend, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that actually um, ALC's like previous reports are also great, um, yeah. you know, starting points and in, in reading, especially with the local context for um, for Allegheny County. Um, and we can try to source those the links for those reports as and, well. Yeah, and ACLU of Pennsylvania has good information on it too. There's um, uh, the report that I mentioned. Uh, I'll throw that in the chat as well. Um, that's a good read. Uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, a lot of it's not Pennsylvania specific too, because the harms are broader than that. Um, yeah, but, but a lot of people, yeah, that this, that the link, both the website that I said, right, sent right above. So it's, you know, criminal justice reform, cash bail, et cetera. That has just like some bullet points on why, you know, cash bail is particularly harmful and punishes, you know, the most vulnerable people. Um, and the Broken Rules Report talks about that somewhat, but also talks about Pennsylvania's broken system more, more broadly. I wanted to address the previous question just a little bit in that motions court, you can, you can appeal for a motion um, for your bond to be reviewed in motions court, which is an upper court in the Court of Common Pleas currently presided over by Judge Burkowski um, and denials of bond do go automatically to motions court. Oh, uh, uh. 
they say that it it is not actually automatic. Um, they love saying that. Yeah, they do. But it's very much not automatic. Most of the time, definitely not automatic. Um, but yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah, that's correct. Like, and it, again, he's a court of common pleas judge. So it can be reviewed upon request most of the time. They're not required. They can deny motions outright, which they do. Oh. without a hearing great well um yeah I'm, I'm glad we got such a range of um engaged and curious questions um there's probably more but um uh katie just dropped in the link for the next court watch orientation for folks who are wondering about how to get involved um and great question christy so um i uh, had the privilege of working with ALC and putting this dashboard together, but um, also want to give a lot of credit to um, poor Swain and Autumn, and Autumn especially in, um, you know, guiding me through, um, you know, the uh, the data and kind of what we're what we were looking at, um, as well as Katie who um, really helped in with, you know, a visual eye and, and design um, design magical mind. <laughs> So thank you all. And um, also, again, like we mentioned, um, you know, the availability of this information in the first place just was built on the backs of a lot of ALC um, volunteers, um, a lot of whom, you know, did a lot, did manual court docket reading and um, parsing and um, just backbreaking work. Um, so. Thank you all for joining and um we, you know we hope that you'll just continue using this ping ideas and thoughts and maybe use it in your own work um i think we're you know in partnership and conversation with many of you so um let's keep that open yeah yeah this is this is a tool for you all to use so please do you know we get get into it be interested by it engage with your mdj engage with other mdjs engage with other people in your community this is this is for for we you know learning things is great but we want we want something to come from it so so and that that all depends on people people engaging with it and then and and working on it afterwards what they based on what they learn also share it with your your local mdj again i know some mdjs have been in this um others are interested in it um but but please like share it with them as well Definitely. Thank you all. Thanks for spending the extra, extra time. Thanks so much, Bonnie, Swain, Katie. Um, Nathaniel has already hopped off. I hope that everyone has a great evening and we will be updating you with the site um, once it's integrated into our website. And we will be reaching out to you to see if you'd like to be a Court Watch volunteer. So thanks again for coming out tonight. We're going to stop recording and uh, we'll send you the link of where you can find this um, recording lodged in and on our YouTube channel. <laughs>